Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, What You Need to Know About New AdWords Features, hosted by Optimizer and Hannapin Marketing. Our presenter today is Frederick Valleys. He's the founder of Optimizer. He's a PPC hero blogger, and he can be found on Twitter at Silicon Valleys. My name is Jeff Baum. I'm an associate director of paid search here at Hannapin Marketing. I'm also a PPC hero blogger, and I can be found on Twitter at JeffBaum71. Fred, welcome back. Looking forward to presenting with you again. Thank you, Jeff. It's good to be back. Uh, let me extend a, a good morning in addition to your good afternoon. Uh, I'm here in California, so just on my second cup of coffee for today, and uh, welcome everyone uh, across the world. Yeah. And we should probably extend a good evening to those people who might be in other parts of the world, and we thank you for joining us. So we would love for you and the audience to join in on the conversation. If you have any questions or comments, just uh, send them uh, through Twitter to the hashtag ThinkPPC, or you can use the webinar question box to send us any questions. So looking forward to hearing from you. So now it's time for our first live poll question. And our question today is how long have you been in PPC? Uh, less than one year, one to three years, three to five years, or five plus years? And we'll give you a minute to fill that out. Cool. So, so people fill that out. I guess uh, I'll give my answer, Jeff. So I've been doing this cool. since technically 1998, um, which is almost 20 years now. Um, and people might ask, did PPC actually exist that long ago? And yes, it did. It was like goto.com. So I was running some ads out of my dorm room at Stanford University to sell VHS video cassettes that I would buy at Blockbuster cheap. And, uh, and then I would resell them basically through eBay. And I was advertising for this using PPC ads. But uh, I guess my, my real claim to fame and how I got really involved in this industry was that um, in 2002, I joined Google. And I was working on AdWords and quality score, and uh, I was the AdWords evangelist for a decade. And then uh, I ended up leaving and starting my company, Optimizer, to try and make PPC management a little bit easier. Um, so that's me. Uh, what about you, Jeff? Uh, that's a great story, Fred. Yeah, I started with AdWords back in late 2003, early 2004. I was actually working for a chemical company, and we were in the process of uh, building a self-service website and digitizing records, so literally taking things out of file cabinets, you know, making them digital records, and then uh, we were also trying to set up a sample system where uh, a person can come in from anywhere in the world, you know, request a sample of a product, and then have the sales rep contact them. Then we started using ads in order to be able to to drive those users to to come to the site, and then it sort of took on a life from its own. Then I would stay up late at night, and then I would study AdWords and try to learn by myself. Back then, you could uh, be an affiliate and run uh, paid search ads directly to uh, uh, to brands and whatnot. So I used that as sort of my training ground. So. Uh, that's how I got my start, and then next thing I know, it, it developed into a career. So it, it's been a pretty interesting story and a pretty interesting ride so far. So you didn't go the dark ride of uh, remaining an affiliate? I'm kidding, by the way. Any affiliates on the call? <laughs> uh, what you guys do, and, and honestly, what affiliates do is uh, you're sort of pushing the boundaries of marketing, and then the big companies catch yep. on, and that's why they didn't say you can no longer do this, and you get sort of that yep. bad reputation. But I was an affiliate, too, and it was pretty cool to do it. And I think it was early enough on before we got the before we got the black mark. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so here are the results. It looks like it's actually pretty evenly divided. Um, so we have a, a bunch of fairly newbies. That's uh, so about 22%, and then 28% uh, of the largest group of people has been doing this just as long as Jeff and myself. So it's great to have you here. Uh, it's going to make it a little bit challenging for the two of us, of course, in terms of presenting at those uh, varying levels of. Um, how advanced you are, but we'll do our best to, to really mostly answer all questions that you have through the Q&A system. Um, okay, and actually one of the first questions that came in before we even started the webinar was, what is new AdWords features? Um, and so we have a whole list. We're going to talk about new ad formats. We're going to talk about bid modifiers. We're going to talk about quality score changing. Um, but the key thing is it's about AdWords, right? So we're talking about AdWords, not about big new features. That's the key answer to uh, what are new AdWords features. So with that, let's uh, 
maybe jump into it, and I'm going to kick it off here with expand the tax time. Um, we sat down to, to think about the topic for today. It was about sort of the announcements that Google made at their last live streaming event, all of the big announcements about what was going to change in AdWords in, the, in 2016. And probably the thing that most people uh, were really looking at, the biggest announcement, was expanded text ads. So the AdWords text ads had been the same size for well over a decade. And all of a sudden, they said, we're now going to give you 140 characters, which is like 60% more space than before, to, uh, to make your message. So we're going to have two lines of headline. And the description line, instead of being two lines, is going to be combined into a single line, which, which is actually a pretty big deal because now you didn't have to figure out how to split one thought into two distinct sentences. And from the Google perspective, this was this, uh, this was a huge announcement. And they really positioned it as this is going to really boost your CTRs, right? And if you have a higher CTR, higher click through rate, you're going to get more visits to your website for the same number of impressions. So you're going to get more opportunities to convince someone to uh, become a lead, to buy something from you, do, do whatever it is that you want them to do on your website. And so two case studies they gave were at Guitar Center doubling their CTR and L'Oreal, uh, another big brand, having a 92% increase in CTR. So uh, let's go to the next slide. So all of this is good and well, right? Uh, but if you're an agency or you're managing a large account, you're super excited about all of this new potential CTR, but you're pulling your hair out because uh, you have all these other things to do, uh, your day-to-day -day account management, and all of a sudden you have this additional task, which is actually not a small task. Writing ad tech used to be very easy, in part because the ads were so short. Now that you actually have a lot more space, you really have to start thinking about what is it that I can do with this space? Am I, am I going to pull on some emotional triggers that might convince people to buy from me? Am I just going to remain very factual and add more descriptions about my products? So that's a significant, um, a significant project, a lot of time that you're going to have to put in. So what, uh, what I came up with was two quick ways to really get started playing uh, with these expanded tax sets. So if we go to the next slide, I'll show you the first one. So <clears throat> the first one is all about the AdWords editor. So I hope all of you have already installed this tool. Uh, by the way, I was one of the people who created this tool way back when, when, uh, uh, when it was version one of the AdWords editor. So always happy to see a lot of people still using this today so many years later. But uh, a new functionality that came out in the latest version of the AdWords editor, if you hit the next button, is there's an export as functionality. So if you look at your text ads and then you look for that button in the top right, it says export your existing legacy text ads as expanded text ads. And what this does is if you go to the next slide, you'll see it generates a spreadsheet where it puts your existing ad text in the correct columns. And then these columns can, of course, be imported back through the AdWords editor after you've made your changes. Um, and that basically converts it from a legacy ad to an expanded text ad. So really, the only thing you have to do in the exported file is fill out a couple of missing fields. The only one that's required is headline number two. You know, if you wanted to be lazy about it, I guess you could just put dynamic keyword insertion across the board for all of these uh, new ads that you're creating. But, the, but if you don't have a headline too, Google will actually reject it. You have to have some value for both of the headline components. Now, path one and path two, these are the URL paths. So Google will automatically take your destination URL. The domain of that is what you're going to show in the ad. By the way, if you do redirect, Google looks at the final uh, domain where the user ends up. So if you have a click tracking URL, that's not what the user is going to see in the ad. Google small where the user eventually ends up. But they just take the, the root domain and then you can specify path one and path two to make it a little bit more relevant. And so basically what you can do is a little bit of keyword stuffing in, uh, in that domain. It doesn't actually have to resolve for anything, but it's just kind of an indicator of relevance to let the user know that you're hopefully taking them to a page that's super relevant about whatever they were searching for. And then there's also a final mobile URL field. So um, now, in addition to having your default landing page, you can also have a specific landing page that you're using when the user is on a mobile device. So you can upload all of this back into the AdWords editor. If you actually didn't fill out the headline twos, then you can use the AdWords editor to do a bulk change to those components. Or you can, of course, do it through Excel or Google Sheets. OK, so that's uh, way number one. If you look at the next slide, um, this is a methodology that I created 
So I said, why don't I create an AdWords script that looks at your SEO data, so your organic um, data on the page, and try to use that to create new ads. And I published this on Search Engine Lens, so you can find that at the, at the link right there. You can download the script that does this for free. Now, kind of my thinking with all of this was, the ads are more and more looking like organic results. And so if they're looking more and more like organic results, why don't we leverage all of the organic work that uh, your team has already done? Maybe it's you or maybe it's someone else in your company, but they've already written meta titles, meta descriptions, et cetera, et cetera. So if you look at the next slide, the basic principle of the script is very easy. It looks at what is your existing landing page. It crawls that page and it extracts three components. It extracts the title, the description, and the primary H1 tag on the page. Then it goes and adjusts each of these for the correct length. Um, and so the good news is that when you look at the headline being two sections of 30 characters each, that's actually pretty close to the recommended length of a, an SEO title, which is around 70 characters. A meta description, obviously, there's, it can be really, really long, but again, there's some recommendations to keep that somewhat short. Uh, there, Google now gives us 80 characters for the ad description. So what we tried to do was do a smart truncation at the end of a word so that whatever ad we're submitting uh, would somewhat make sense. And so if you look at the next slide, the, the purpose of the script is to generate a spreadsheet. And this spreadsheet can again be imported directly into AdWords Editor to quickly make expanded text ads. And so in this example, we, we just took our own domain and we basically pulled out the meta titles, meta descriptions. Um, we then put that into, so, so we took the meta title, split it into two components, up to 30 characters each, and we show you how many characters each of those is. So as you come to this Google spreadsheet, as you start tweaking this text a little bit, you actually see the character count so that you know you're staying within the limits for when you upload it back through the editor. So that's another quick way to do this. Um, and kind of what I was saying was you can do this in 30 seconds, but honestly, um, I recommend you put in a little bit more time. We use this as a great starting point uh, for something new to test. Okay, let's take a look at the next slide. So uh, with all of this, once you have your expanded text ads running, just like before, you still have to do some A-B testing. You still have to figure out which of my ads are the winners and the losers. Now here's the thing, you don't automatically assume that expanded text ads are gonna be the winners. Uh, even though Google has these great case studies of companies having tremendous increases in CTR, uh, there's a couple things about that. Well, first of all, you may not actually care that much about CTR. If you're trying to sell something, click-through rate is really not that meaningful. What you care about is conversions. Now conversions by themselves are also not that useful because if you have a high converting uh, ad text, but nobody clicks on it, well then that's no good either, right? But what you want to look for is a combination of CTR and conversion rate. That's a metric that's called conversions per impression. That's really what you should shoot for. Um, so even if the CTR is much better, that in and of itself is not necessarily a good thing for your business. Um, and then the other thing is the, the case studies that Google has given, obviously these are companies that did well with expanded text ads. There's many, many cases of companies that are not doing well with expanded text ads. So don't assume that these are the new winners by default. So if you look at the next slide, we, uh, we took a screenshot from our tool at Optimizer. We have an A-B testing tool. And so yesterday we added a new functionality which lets you compare expanded ads versus legacy ads on the same screen. So that helps you make the decision whether it's time for you to turn off your legacy ads or maybe they're still performing better. So as in this case, you see the legacy ad actually has a better CTR, and that's statistically significant. However, the expanded text ad, much worse CTR, but conversions per impression is doing much, much better. Um, so in this case, I would probably want to keep the expanded text ad, but I might pause the legacy ad because if at some point I want to turn it back on. Uh, remember, of course, Google is going to turn off your ability to make legacy ads. And when that, once that ability is gone, there's no way to get these back, right? So I kind of want to keep them around as long as possible, just in case. Okay, let's take a look at the next slide here. <clears throat> so uh, when it comes to considerations for testing your ads, you still have to ask the usual questions. And the usual questions about ad testing is, you should compare brand and non-brand separately, right? Brand typically is gonna have a much better CTR, so you don't want to mix that in with non-branded terms. 
you also want to take a look at when your ads showed up in similar locations on the page. If uh, your legacy ad happens to get a lot of coverage at the top of the page and maybe your uh, expanded text ad gets a lot of coverage at the bottom of the page, then you're not really comparing apples to apples. So you should really normalize for that. Uh, you should compare ads that got roughly the same number of impressions. So if you're using a tool or a statistical significance calculator, keep in mind some companies run different ads on the weekends and the weekdays. So you're probably going to see some significant diversion or difference between the number of impressions of the different ads. And so uh, generally we like to look at ads that roughly have the same number of impressions because that kind of indicates they probably got the same opportunities at the same times to, uh, to show. And then you also have to compare performance on different devices. So uh, your winner on a mobile device is not necessarily going to be your winner on a desktop device. These can actually be different. Now, in the light of expanded text ads and all of these new changes, the new questions that I think we should be asking is, are the expanded text ads better than the legacy ads? Um, so in other words, if we switch off the legacies, should we switch off legacy ads now, or should we wait to do this until later? Um, and then if you find that expanded text ads are doing better, then figure out which one has the best performance and start doing a, a testing cycle for these ETAs. And then uh, the big question, is, so do different ad formats win on different devices? So like the example I gave you before, and now the reason this is such an important question, if you go to the next slide, is that kind of this one thing that Google didn't mention when they made this big hoopla about expanded text ads, was the fact that there's no more mobile preferred options. Um, so in this screenshot on the left, you see a legacy ad. There, there was a checkbox where you could say this is a mobile preferred ad. Now that was never a guarantee it would show on mobile, but it was a preference that you could communicate to Google. On the right-hand side, these are the new expanded text ads. You see that option is no longer there. So you have a mobile URL, but you're no longer able to say something different on a mobile device versus a non-mobile device. And so kind of what Google is saying is pick your most important device and optimize for this. Uh, what I think is you should probably try to optimize for the best overall results. Uh, definitely use a mobile landing page. And if you look at the next slide, look at the next slide. So here we have um, kind of the overall results, right? So the test that we've done with an optimizer we ran the two automated methods that I just explained to you, and we saw 26% better CTR with a 95% confidence level. And this was mostly for non-brand keywords. Um, so we were pretty happy with that. Now, Merkle RKG had a great study. Uh, Andy Taylor just published that on Search Engine Land. And what they were finding is that brand ads showing at the top of the page, typically the expanded text ad has a worse performance than the legacy ad. Uh, but not huge differences, right? So with a, a margin of error of, I think, plus minus 2%, in some cases, the desktop is actually pretty close to even, but on phone and tablet, it was significantly worse. Non-brand ads showing at the top of the page were basically flat. And then the big winner, though, that they found was non-brand ad showing at the bottom of the page. Those are seeing significant lifts, lifts in CTR. So again, it kind of uh, begs the question then for your company, your business, where do most of your ads show? Um, if you happen to have a lot of brand ads at the top of the page, then maybe there's no huge rush jumping into expanded text ads because they're probably not going to do that much better. Right? But again, uh, as in all cases, these are averages. These are kind of industry numbers. Uh, individual results will vary. And like we saw, we actually did pretty well. Uh, but you may be in a different market and you may not do so well. So that's why we should always be testing, of course. Okay, so if we look at the next slide, um, I think that's actually, yeah, so that's, that's kind of my bit on um, expand the text ad. I'm going to let Jeff talk about GDF. Great. Thanks a lot, Fred. And, you know, definitely great insights about uh, expanded text ads. Uh, I think you make a good point about being uh, careful before making the quick hook on the legacy ads. You know, until Google pulls that functionality completely, we can continue to learn and hone our expanded text ad messages, you know, up until the very last minute while, uh, you know, more and more people are coming into the auctions with, with those expanded text ads. You know, any last bit of learning could, you know, certainly help. 
So I'm going to talk about GDN responsive ads. So if you look at this, uh, these screenshots here, you'll see today's ads and what they look like. You can see uh, standard text ads, native, and rich media. And then if you look at GDN responsive ads on the other side of the page, you can see where Google is going in terms of uh, look and feel of, of ads. They're a lot sharper. They have the look and feel of the site uh, that they're advertising on a lot more. So what are these GDN responsive ads? They're actually the GDN version of expanded text ads. So uh, GDN ads are getting more characters. So you're actually going to get 204 or 205 characters. So you're going to get a lot more space to be able to convey your message, which is really good news because GDN, your uh, users are in an active search mode, so it usually takes a little bit more explanation to explain, explain what your brand is and what your service offering or what your product offering is. The other thing that GDN responsive ads do that are pretty exciting is the ads automatically adjust. So size, appearance, format, is going to fit the ad spaces on the particular landing page. It's going to automatically optimize even down to the font. So the whole idea is these ads, whether they're native, whether they're text, whether they're images, they're going to be able to adjust to, to the look and feel and really give those ads the look of, of the site that they're on. And, and even from AdSense tests, you know, way back, uh, uh, I remember uh, those ads would perform a lot better when they had more of the look and feel of the site that they were on. So this should help improve the responsiveness because the ads itself won't look like so much of an outlier. It'll really feel like the content of the site and should fit in nice and neat. So GDN responsive ads, they actually work pretty easy from a, a user standpoint in getting started. So what you do is you enter in your assets. So you'll enter in headlines, uh, the images that you want to use, uh, the landing page, uh, enter in the business name. Uh, entering, you enter in all these assets, and then AdWords automatically generates the ads. So they're taking you know, all your messaging and, and images, and they're going to conform it to how that ad should best look and feel on the actual site that that ad is going to show up on. The images, they're actually suggestions based off of your landing page. So one of the biggest things that, that's tough with image ads and, and really getting them adopted is a lot of times we just don't have the resources. Uh, we either need the art department if we're you know, working uh, in-house and trying to get their time and, and energy to be able to create, create banner ads for us, and then uh, – if you're agency or if you're a freelancer, a lot of times you have to retain the services of the graphic designer, and that's expensive, and it, it slows down the adoption of it. And it actually does cause a little bit of an issue because Google offers so many different ad sizes. Uh, a lot of us default to text ads, but you're leaving out so much opportunity for your ads to show. So you're, you're limiting your exposure and you're limiting uh, the people that you can reach. So uh, being able to uh, you know, have those images generated for you off of actual content you already have and, image, and, and landing pages that are already in use gives a nice, sharp, crisp message. In addition to that, you can also upload logos, uh, you know, other, you know, specific assets that you might have that allows you to control branding and messaging even further. So ads are going to look sharper and give you more credibility when you can have your logo, and Google is allowing you to do that with these ads. So on this slide here, we just have some ad specs for responsive ads. So if you look at the current GDN text ads, you have a 25-character uh, headline, uh, a two descriptions, 35 characters each. So you're getting about 95 total characters of space in today's current ads. But what you also can't do is upload images, the advertiser name, or upload a logo. Uh, the final URL is pro uh, provided visual URL, so when you're, you're typing in that URL, 
uh, there's always that chance of uh, of user error, you know, putting in, you know, a wrong character, you know, in, in the wrong spot, and it could cause your ads to get disapproved. Where GDN responsive ads has taken the good parts of uh, expanded text ads and was able to adapt it. So now you're going to get a double headline. You're actually going to get a short uh, headline of 25 characters, then a 90 character long headline, plus a 90 character description. And then if you follow uh, the specs that are listed on here, then you can upload that image that we were talking about. And then the uh, 25 character final URL is pulled basically the same way from uh, uh, like the way the expanded text ads do it, they pull it from the domain. Uh, you can enter your advertiser name, you get 25 characters, and then you can upload that that logo according to these specs. So a lot of neat new functionality that it, that's coming on the scene. So setting up GDN responsive ads are pretty simple. So what you do is in the AdWords interface, you can click on the ads tab. Then you just click on the red ad button, and then from the drop down, you choose responsive ads. Once you do that, you're just going to come up to a setup screen, which is very clean and straightforward, where you can enter in your short and long headline, your descriptions, your business names, and final URLs, and all that. And then you have also advanced URL options. So if you need to enter in tracking templates and you're doing, you know, other sort of URL customizations, you can enter all that in on the ad level if you want. And then you can see on top, there's an area where I uh, uploaded an image just for the purpose of this screenshot. I just grabbed one of Google standard preview screens. And then I left it blank, but you have the space where you just uh, click on the the, the pencil, uh, that's your edit button, you upload your logo, and then it's right there. And then once you've done that, then your ads are going to look something like this. So this is what the headline, or I'm sorry, the text format, or, or the text ads are going to look like. So a little bit more sharper. This is an example of an image ad and what it's going to look like. So the, the top portion is where your image would go. And then the final example is what your ad would look like in the native format. So these are just previews from, from Google's preview tool, but they can't show every ad style and certainly can't show uh, what ad would look like on every possible site. So in reality, the headline, the image, and the native ads, or I'm sorry, the text ads, image ads, and native ads are going to look a lot sharper and a lot cleaner, really look like the content of the, the site that you're advertising on. So that's GDN responsive ads and some of the changes that are coming down. So we have a couple of right. uh, key takeaways, and we'll let Fred jump in and discuss some of them. Yeah, and this, uh, this is really awesome, just how easy it is to make these responsive ads. Yep. So, but anyway, uh, my key takeaways here for all of these new ad formats is start testing the expanded text ad now, especially given how easy it can be using the two methods that I showed you. Uh, but then don't make the assumption that legacy ads are going to be worse. So keep those around for a little bit longer. Um, and then also try to find the expanded ad that beats legacy ads on all devices. Um, and I didn't quite talk about this, but there might actually be situations now where you will maybe want to have separate campaigns um, separate campaigns for different device types. And then, Jeff, I think the next two are yours. Yep. So just a couple of key takeaways on my end. Responsive ads, they can fill critical coverage gaps on GDN. So if you don't have the ability to create a lot of image ads or, or, or whatnot, uh, just being able to enter in the assets and covering all that gr that middle ground in between could could certainly help. And then just talking about testing strategy tactics in general. So whether it's expanded text ads or whether it's the uh, GDN responsive ads, there's so much more for us to test now uh, that we really need to rethink our testing strategies. Uh, we're way beyond just testing punctuation and and maybe just a call to action. We have. Uh, two headlines and, and descriptions, and we're going to learn a lot about 
what people are actually reading on ads and, and all of that. So take the time now to start thinking through your strategy. So this way, when expanded text ads uh, come on the scene, you know, 100%, uh, I believe it's the end of October when they're retiring the legacy ads, and when GDN ad, uh, responsive ads come on the scene, that we've already thought through these things and we're ready to go with our testing and we're a step ahead. Great. So um, let me tell you about a small change that Google announced uh, just about a week, week and a half ago. Uh, did you All right, um, so sorry about that. They asked me to go off in my headset and I have someone push the button to end my call. But, uh, but anyway, a small change that Google announced uh, that many of you may not have noticed is that we're actually going to change a little bit how quality score works. So as of September 12th, keywords that don't have enough data will show you a quality score of dash dash. And so if you go to the next slide, what that means is that you're actually going to get better insight into your real quality scores. About a year, year and a half ago, Google changed uh, this as well. So it used to be that a new keyword would start off with a quality score that was based on the prediction of how it would perform. So it was based on account quality score, a bunch of other factors. And then they changed it and they said, now every keyword that's new is going to have a quality score of six. But that was kind of confusing because now you would look at your account and you'd see all of these keywords with a quality score of six. And this is another screenshot from our tool. You see that little bar there at the bottom. Uh, the different quality scores. So you see most accounts have a lot of quality score six keywords. But you don't know if that's because a lot of these keywords are new, Google doesn't have enough information, or because you truly have a quality score of six for that particular account. Um, and so now there's going to be new clarity coming around this because anything that has a quality score of six is truly a quality score of six. So if you go to the next slide, uh, again, this is not a huge change, but I did want to mention this to people, especially because I was on the quality score team for quite a number of years. So if anyone has questions about this, it would be a great topic to ask me about. But I think what it means is you're going to have much better insight into what your real quality score is. Your ad rank and your CPC should not change. And that's because the quality score number of 1 through 10 that Google shows you is just kind of a representation. But it's not the same as the real-time quality score that is used at every single auction and every single search that happens. Uh, but if you want to know how this is going to impact you, again, September 12th is the change date. So be cracking your quality scores before and after. At the very least, I think you should take a snapshot maybe on September 11th of all your quality scores and then again do the same thing after the change has gone live so that you can see which of your keywords have shifted um, and if maybe something else happened beyond what Google announced they would do. I mean, that's actually what we kind of found in the last change. Uh, they said one thing was going to change, but it had a, a little bit more impact on other things as well. So I think it's just generally nice to know what exactly happened to my account. And then especially if you work with clients, right, because they might at some point notice, they might ask you about it, um, and you're going to look like a PPC hero if you actually have an answer to that question for them. So anyway, that's enough about quality score. Uh, let's talk about some other new features from, uh, from Jeff here. Great, appreciate all the insight on quality score. You know, that, that, that's really important and, and something that we should be thinking about right now. So I'm going to spend a couple minutes talking about converted clicks. Uh, it's actually a feature that's going away. Uh, probably in the end it won't be a huge change, but it's one that we need to be thinking about uh, uh, for sure and, and because a lot of us use converted clicks or have used it in the past to uh, optimize our accounts against. So the converted click metric is being retired by September 21st of this year. So uh, it's going to go away in a hurry. Um, the converted click metric is actually a legacy metric that was developed a couple of years ago, and it really reflected a different time in, in paid search marketing where we were really focused on the last click uh, attribution, and we were really focused on unique conversions. I know myself from primarily being in the lead generation space, you tend to look at a lot of those unique conversions. How many unique people filled out uh, a lead form and then optimize against that. But what's happened over the last few years 
is that the path to conversion has gotten very sophisticated. So it, it's not so straightforward anymore where it's, it's formed to conversion. So even on the lead generation side, uh, you have people that are uh, they're going across device. They're also uh, looking at YouTube videos. They're visiting other channels. So there's a lot ha that happens before someone ultimately lands on your landing page and they actually convert. And convert to clicks just doesn't, it doesn't pick up all of that data. The, the metric is kind of restrictive, restrictive in that respect. So what do you need to know about converted clicks? So what's going to happen is all, uh, all conversion metrics are going to now feed into the conversion metrics tab. They're, they're actually going to feed in actually to the conversions column, I'm sorry. And uh, cross-device conversions are automatically going to be included in their starting 9.6. So Google is deeming that cross-device conversions are important and they're automatically going to count it. So you need to be aware of that because you are going to be using this data to optimize. The good thing is you can count the conversion types you deem important. So you can set different conversion tracking uh, types in, in conversion tracking, and we'll, we'll discuss how you set that up in a minute. And you can include in the conversion column the metrics that are important to you to optimize. So you may want to track a bunch of different conversion types, but you may not want to optimize against them all. So you have that, op, uh, that ability to, to include what you want. And ultimately, I believe it gives better flexibility to measure all touch points as opposed to just one. But you can also measure unique conversions as well. So you just have to work on reconfiguring your conversion tracking a little bit. And really, it's the conversion settings to be able to decide what type of conversions that you want to track. And then on this slide here, this is just a, a visual output that, that Google had put together to really show how conversions are, are going to be counted in the future. So this is a good example of an e-commerce client that is selling product and then also looking to get downloads for a catalog. So you might wind up with two converted clicks and three conversions. So there, right now, you would see in the converted clicks column, you would see two uh, two converted clicks, you would see see three conversions in the uh, conversions tab, it's a little bit confusing. Um, advertisers can now see everything all together in one spot and then you can decide how to optimize against it. There are some bidding ramifications and Fred, feel free to join in if you have some perspectives as well. But uh, when we move over to the conversions only uh, metric and we do away with converted clicks, it is going to affect automated bidding. So if you're using Google tools, for example, like enhanced CPC or target CPA bids, uh, you're going to want to wait a couple weeks before updating them because you are feeding more information into it. So that means that the system is going to have to learn uh, all over again. So making too drastic of a change right after this goes live could cause some performance um, up and down. So it's something to be aware of. And you really also have to think about how you're valuing your different conversions. So when I use that, that YouTube example, uh, that's an assisted click, but that may not be a full I wouldn't count that necessarily as a full value. I might count that as a half a conversion, a quarter of a conversion. Uh, if we have all this different type of conversion data sort of feeding into one spot, we have to be careful against overbidding or, or underbidding. So we really need to think about how we're valuing our conversions to make sure that we're valuing, valuing our conversions correctly arrive at the right bids. So now I'm going to talk about how to set up conversion actions. Uh, it's actually pretty simple. Uh, if you just go in the AdWords interface to Tools and then click on Conversions, you'll open up your conversion actions. So you'll see here you have a summary of it. So in this example, this is from an account of mine. Uh, 
the convergent action is leads, and then it has just the different parameters where the, the source is the website, the category we're tracking is leads, whether or not we want to convert, uh, include that in the convergence account. So you get a basic idea of the type of uh, um, conversions that you, you have set up. And then just by clicking on that red conversion button, you can set up m uh, multiple conversion types when you do it all from this screen. Then if we go into the settings, then we can we can see, you know, fully all of the different settings that make up this conversion type. And then we can, you know, decide things like conversion window, uh, whether we want to count every conversion or if we want to count just unique conversions. If we have values that we want to enter, uh, this is where we would enter the value for that conversion type. And we can also enter things like the attribution model. And then when we further open up the uh, um, the settings, we can decide whether or not to include in conversions. So this is where you would decide that this uh, particular uh, bucket of conversions I that I'm tracking, I actually want to include in my data and optimize against it or not. And then in the count here, when you click that button, that's where you can decide whether you want to uh, track it as a conversion or track it like a converted click. So what we'll essentially be able to do is track it unique or attract all after we, re after we remove the converted clicks metric. Um, up until uh, the sixth, we still have the option of whether or not to include cross device conversions, but just be aware, uh, as I said earlier, that this is automatically gonna happen anyway. So now I'm going to move on and I'm going to talk a little bit about in some updates to enhanced campaigns. So before we jump in, I'm just going to summarize the current functionality. So enhanced campaigns are basically a desktop first mentality. So all bids stem from the base desktop bid. So we don't have the ability right now to optimize tablets. Uh, bids work, uh, or mobile bids work off of bid modifiers. We can bid up or down, but we can't change the base bid for mobile. Uh, we have to treat all keywords basically the same by device, except for the, the modifier. We can't have separate keyword lists. We can't have a mobile list. We can't have a desktop list. So we're kind of restricted in the, the keywords that we're allowed to uh, to, to buy or not. We have to kind of do it all. It's all lumped together. Uh, we do have mobile specific ads right now where we can have a bit of a, a mobile specific experience, but the flexibility of enhanced campaigns is kind of limited. So the update that's coming is going to create a more flexible approach. We're now going to be able to have base bids by any device. For example, if we want to bid we want our base bids to be mobile, we can do that. We can set our base bids at the mobile level, and let's say we don't want to advertise on desktop, we can then set base bids of negative 100%. We could do the same thing with tablet. So it gives us a lot of flexibility to you know, manage each device uh, more separately. Uh, bid modifiers are going to change. The current bid modifier is 300%, and the bid modifier range is going to increase up to 900%. So you do have more flexibility. Those are pretty big modifiers, but you have a lot more leeway to really capitalize on, you know, those auctions that are successful to you and also to put yourself into new auctions. And then this flexibility gives you more ability to go granular in your approach to your, your paid advertising. So what does this all mean? It means uh, that device-specific campaigns are back. So that means we can create desktop, mobile, and tablet-specific campaigns. We can have specific keywords. We can have specific ads. And this is a great way to compensate when uh, uh, enhanced uh, I'm sorry, expanded text ads come onto the scene and we lose the mobile ad functionality, we can create a mobile-specific ad because it's going to be inside of a mobile-specific campaign. So it allows us to have device-specific specific strategies, and you can have different intents because, let's face it, different devices attract slightly different types of be uh, user behavior. So you can now account for all of this and advertise against it accordingly. 
So in this slide, just wanted to give uh, a visual uh, representation of what a current uh, enhanced campaign structure looks like. So you have uh, your keywords, campaigns, all that is in, in one place. And then you have your bids and your bid modifiers. And what I did in this example, uh, just for, for red, it's a red shoe campaign for, for this example, we bid exactly the same, but the mobile bid modifiers were adjusted based off of performance. So for example, we found on mobile, buy red shoes doesn't convert. So we uh, set a negative 100% bid modifier. Uh, and then we set bid modifiers accordingly for the other, for the other keywords. Then uh, we created desktop ads that speak a little bit differently to desktop users versus mobile. So for example, desktop, uh, we know that users are a little bit more ready to buy for purpose of this example. So we put in the headline, buy red shoes today, uh, you know, so we can capture that buy audience. And then with mobile, we, we changed the ad slightly to acknowledge that people are on a smartphone. So, you know, we're asking people to search red shoes and find the style you like because we, we still want them to buy, but we know that they may not be quite ready. So moving on to the next example, which is a device specific campaign. So what you'll see here is that the keyword uh, buy red shoes isn't there. So this way I can have a keyword list that's specific to mobile. And then I can have one that's specific to desktop. So I might focus my uh, mobile campaigns more towards research and consideration and focus my desktop more towards bottom of funnel and people making purchases. So it allowed me to create an ad, you know, that talks more about browsing, browsing our selection and comparing prices. So it allows me to have a different, uh, completely different approach to, you know, match the user behavior for that particular, uh, for that particular device segment. So I'll turn it back over to Fred. He's going to talk a little bit more about some bid modifiers. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so like you explained, there's a lot of new complexity, new considerations that people have to take. And uh, one of the things that I noticed happens with modifiers, now, not just device bot modifiers, but audience bid modifiers, hour of week, geography modifiers. There's actually a lot of bid modification going on. And so these modifiers can actually make your bids go out of control. Um, in an auction, you typically know what you're bidding. In an AdWords auction, it's become really complicated because you have your base level CPC, and then that's being modified by five other things. So I decided, if you look at the next slide, to build a little script for this. Um, and yes, I'm kind of a scripts guy, so everything I do has some sort of a script associated with it. But, uh, but what the point was, was to figure out what is your CPC bid for each keyword, and then given all the bid modifications that you have in place for those campaigns and those ad groups, what is the highest and the lowest that you would ever be bidding? So you can see in this example, for a number of these keywords, I'm actually sometimes bidding zero dollars, so I'm not participating in some of these auctions. Uh, but in other cases, my bid is somewhat higher than my actual CPC. Now, the, I don't, don't show it in this specific example on this slide, but I did find one branded keyword which had an actual bid of up to $120. Um, I was actually quite shocked when I found this in one of the, uh, the accounts that we look at because there was just no reason for it. But because we had set a number of modifiers, it was actually taking the bid significantly higher than expected in some cases. Um, and it also kind of opens up an interesting thought exercise, which is what is your actual bid compared to your top of page CPC and first page CPC? As you know, Google makes recommendations about how much you need to bid to be on the first page, but that is a CPC, that's like kind of like a base level CPC bid, and it doesn't take into account all of the bid modifiers that are out there. Um, so even if your actual CPC bid seems to be lower than what's required to be on page one or to be at the top of the page, you may in fact be bidding enough for those specific options where it makes sense, right? So for the geographies where you do really well, the times of day when you do really well, and all of these other bid modifiers. So uh, anyway, you can download that script, run it on your account, and kind of get a quick sense for what your bid landscape looks like. So let's look at the next slide. So um, what I wanted to talk about here is, and again, what Jeff just said it is really significant. You can now actually have bid modifiers of negative 100%. Now, this is not available in all accounts. It's rolling out 
globally right now. Uh, I don't know exactly when it's going to be in all accounts. Generally, I've seen if you start up a new account, you'll be able to see this. If you want to experiment with it, that would be the quickest way to get access. Um, but th this does open up new ways of structuring your account. Now, let's take a look at the next slide. Um, and we'll wrap up here in about three more slides, and then we'll take questions. But, uh, but Google talks about this notion of anchoring your bid. So like Jeff was explaining, in the past, you would set your bid for a desktop device, and that was kind of your anchor, right? So let's take that whole anchoring um, example, and let's attach a boat to the anchor. And so the boat is sitting on the water, so you have a desktop bid, bid which is basically the bottom where the anchor is sitting. And then you have your mobile bid modifier, which is the chain that connects up to the boat. Okay, so you do this once, you got your desktop bids right, you got your mobile bids right, so you're all happy. But now you move on to the next slide, and all of a sudden the boat has been moving and the ground is at a different level. So basically your anchor has changed. Uh, that's, that's your desktop bid, right? So the situation, something has changed, you've just changed your desktop bid. Well, if you forgot to look at your mobile bid modifier and you kept the chain to the anchor at the same length, you'd be bidding the wrong amount for mobile. And so kind of the point I'm trying to make is that by having all these bid modifiers, it actually adds a lot of complexity because now every time you change the desktop bid, it actually impacts all of your other bids as well. So you have to remember to go and fix those. In fact, one thing that we see a lot is that people, when they do bid management, they look at all of their AdWords data and they set a new CPC bid and then they still have modifiers running separately from that. Uh, but basically what you need to be doing is you need to look at your specific segments. So you need to look at the AdWords data just for your anchor, say desktop uh, performance. That sets your CPC bid, which is tied to your desktops. And then separately, you should be doing a similar exercise to figure out the correct bid modifiers for the different devices. So if you go to the next slide, uh, one proposal I have, and I don't know if this is necessarily the right thing, but it's kind of a, again another thought exercise that's now possible because of this new landscape that we're seeing. If you look at the next slide, is you could set some static bid as your anchoring point, um, and so now you can say, well, every time I want to make a bid modification, I'm just going to play with my modifiers. So, for example, I set a one dollar CPC for the ad group, and then if I want a bit more for desktop, I change the desktop modifier. But changing that has no impact on what happens to mobile and tablet. So it's kind of segmenting it out and making it a little bit easier to understand. Now, the downside of this, of course, is that ad group is the lowest level of bid modification you can do for device types. So this would require you to have single keyword ad groups. Uh, but like Jeff was explaining too, that might actually be the right thing to do. So maybe you want to have different uh, device specific single keyword ad groups so that you get back that highest level of control. And you specifically would want to do this for your high volume, high value keywords. And then the long tail, you know, this might be overkill in terms of structure, uh, but at least for the, the stuff where you make most of your money, having that level of granular control might actually be a very good thing. Okay, so um, I think that was my final slide. So uh, yeah, anyway, we have key takeaways. So know how these modifiers impact your bid, current bid management decisions, uh, investigate how the introduction of the tablet bid modifier, which is rolling out now, can change your strategy and structure, and then consider if it makes sense to employ modifiers um, and where it makes sense to build specific device type templates. So with that, let's go to questions here. Um, and while we go through the questions, we also have a couple of offers, so if you're interested in taking advantage of one of these, you can just uh, select one or uh, one of these boxes, and then we'll reach back out to you. Um, so we'll go back to, uh, to the first question we got here, which was from Alejandro, uh, who's asking, is there a possibility to adapt and bulk the old text ads to expand the text ad? So you have about 5,000 ads to convert. Um, so yeah, the AdWords editor is probably your best way to go about that. It's really about making bulk changes to your account. Uh, so do take a look at the AdWords editor functionality for that. Um, Carl was asking, how long will this last before all accounts have the expanded text ads feature and it's no longer exclusive? Uh, so expanded text ads are now live for everyone. So if you haven't seen it, um, there's probably something wrong with your account. Uh, so go and ask your Google account manager about that. As far as the tablet bid modifiers, that's currently rolling out on a percentage basis. So uh, you may not have it quite yet but the rollout is increasing every day. They haven't given me a, 
a final date for when it's supposed to be at 100%, but check back on your accounts on a daily basis. Okay, um, Regine is asking about mobile expanded text ads. Do they also have 140 characters? And yes, they do, right? So now there's a single ad format. All ads have 140 characters, all the text ads at least. And there is no distinction between mobile and desktop ads. Okay, and then uh, Melanie was asking, would you guys know if customer match is available for the display network? Uh, just wondering when I look at the GDN ads. Jeff, maybe that's a good question for you. So question four, is customer match available for the display network? Yeah, yes, customer match is, is available for the display network. Uh, I would think that the responsive ads when they come out will just enhance everything. It should, it should enhance uh, you know, the conversions because you're already hitting a targeted audience. And then the next question is also about GDN. So we were just asking for the responsive ads that we talked about. Uh, do you have to be part of the display advertiser network? Um, or is that a whole separate thing in AdWords? So kind of giving context of where it lives in the AdWords ecosystem. Sure, so it's going to be part of the AdWords ecosystem. So as an advertiser, as long as you're running an ad campaign or a display ad campaign and you're, uh, you're opted in to display, then the functionality will, will take over. Okay, great. And then John was asking also about these responsive ads. Um, can those work when your targeting is retargeting? As far as I understand, they should work with retargeting. It, it's it's really a, a equivalent to just adding an additional format, or, or ad format, I should say. Exactly. So it doesn't change anything to your targeting for GDN. It's just the ad format that's going on. No, but it strictly has to do with ads. Yeah. Um, and then Johanna was asking, can you please explain the main difference between native image and text ads? Sure. So, you know, text ads don't have any images at all. It's just straight text. Just like if you went out to Google now, you would just see straight text. Uh, image ads is a static image, you know, so kind of like the old banner ads. And then native ads have the look and feel of the page you're on. So, for example, if, you, if you're on Yahoo's uh, homepage and you have that content feed, uh, you usually see in, like, the number three and 13 spot, you'll see uh, – it's an ad, but it looks just like the content. That's actually a native ad. Yeah, take advantage of those before the FTC cracks down is uh, sort of my thought on those. They're very confusing and misleading to consumers. Um, yep. But they get results, right? So as marketers, that's a uh, that's while it lasts. Lots, lots of engagement. Yeah, exactly. Um, next question came from Carl. He's asking why test the legacy ads if we know that ETAs are going to be the main ones in October. So actually, Carl, I haven't heard the exact cutoff date when Google's going to stop showing legacy ads. And there is a date at which they no longer allow us to make legacy ads. But my philosophy is very simple here. If the legacy ad, for whatever reason, performs better than the expanded text ad, then there's no reason for me to jump into uh, switching over to the new system uh, because, for me, it's all about the results, right? So take advantage of the variety of options that you have for as long as you can. That's just what yep. I think about it. Yeah, my, my understanding of expanded text ads is that you won't be able to create any more of the legacy ads after October 26th. Uh, I did hear something, uh, I believe it's sometime in the beginning of next year, where they'll start to remove the, the legacy ads from the actual results. So that is something to consider in the future. You know, the, the, uh, the, the date of when that happened might get pushed back, but there's going to be a point where they're only going to show expanded text ads. So at some point, we're going to have to have them created throughout our entire account. Yeah, but it still takes us through the holiday season, which is a big one for a lot of the retailers. So if you can right. keep the benefits from legacy ads, then go for it. Um, questions are changing a little bit here. So as far as quality score, a couple of questions. Do we know what Google is defining as insufficient data? Um, so Google hasn't specifically defined that, but in our research at Optimizer, we have seen that it takes generally about 100 impressions before it seems like Google almost certainly knows what your quality score should be. Now, the one new element is that you're adding a time factor to this. And so we haven't done that research to see 100 impressions over how much time are required. Um, so it looks like if, if you have very few impressions, 
over recent history, then you might also fall in this bucket of having dash dash quality score. And that's interesting because you could go from having a number for quality score to all of a sudden having no number because your historical uh, data has become too sparse. Okay, we're, uh, we got one minute left here, so many times. Um, mm -hmm. Great question. Um, so, yeah, they're all pretty good. It's kind of hard to pick the, the best one, but um, maybe let's do another quality score one. Mm -hmm. So, if you've been calculating impression rated quality scores, will you see any big changes in how quality score is being used? Um, yeah, if you're using impression rated quality score numbers, then those have been really uh, influenced by the fact that new keywords used to be quality score of six. Now those are going to go out of the mix. So I think you're going to see your impression rated quality score number uh, go further away from a number of six. So it may get closer to a 10, it may get closer to a one, but it's actually going to be a more real indicator of how your account performance is. And I keep in mind that real account performance is actually what Google uses at the time of the auction to make decisions about keywords where they just don't have a lot of data. Um, so I think that account level score is really important to know and to, to make sure it's a good one. Um, and that will change on September 12th. So that brings us to the top of the hour. Um, let's uh, invite people to come to HeroConf. So myself and Jeff are going to be there. This is coming up in October. Um, we like the show so much at Optimizer that we decided to sponsor it. Um, and I'm also going to be speaking at the show and I'll have a session where I'm going to do uh, 10 scripts that you can install in your account today to get some immediate benefits. And so what those scripts are and you'll be able to copy and paste them and start using them right away. Um, and I'll also do a keynote about the future of the industry and what I think is going to be coming in AdWords soon. Um, so it would be great if you would join us for that one. And then if we didn't get to your question or you wanted to talk to us some more, we do have a couple of email addresses you can reach out to. Uh, they're right there, one for Hannepin, one for Optimizer. Um, I want to thank you very much for uh, attending the webinar today, spending some time with us. Um, and I'll hand it back over to Jeff to, uh, to close us out. Yep, I'd just like to, uh, you know, thank you, Fred, for joining us today. As always, very informative, and I hope everyone in the audience uh, found uh, the content, you know, informative and, and actionable. So with that, we are done for today. So, Fred, uh, thank you for your time, and we'll talk to you all soon.